Hello, and welcome to the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival. My name is Laura Garcia, and I'm here to talk to you about the world of post-production sound. With me today are three amazing creators. They are re-recording mixer Juan Peralta, re-recording mixer Frank Montano, and sound super, supervising sound editor Brian Parker. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here meet you as well. Um, I wanted to uh, start off the uh, conversation. Um, if you could briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. If you want to, uh, if you want to start one. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Juan Peralta. I'm a re-recording mixer at Skywalker Sound. Um, my main job has been mostly um, re uh, mixing uh, sound effects for major motion pictures. TVs, video games, a um, little bit of everything. Uh, but I've been at Skywalker for over 20 years now and um, do a lot of work at uh, Disney in Los Angeles, in Burbank, California. Nice. Nice. Frank? Hi, I'm Frank Montano. Um, in the industry, they call me Frankie. Um, I am actually work for Universal Studios. Um, so there's a little plug for the sponsor. <laughs> um, I've been at Universal for 20 years. I've been in the uh, re-recording chair for 35 years or so. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and to tell our stories. Thank you. Thank you. And Brian? I'm Brian Parker. I'm a supervising sound editor um, currently at, at Formosa Group. I work in both uh, broadcast um, and features divisions, mostly in um, mostly in an indie feature space, some some studio pictures. But um, um, I've been uh, you know working in sound, working in you know film, TV sound for about 15 years. I've been at Formosa for about five. Great, great, nice. Can you, um, can you all three of you elaborate a little bit on what exactly is post-production sound um, and what elements go into uh, creating, adding to the projects? Should start with Brian. Um, generally, um, my work involves uh, communicating with, with, um, with the director or showrunner, um, you know, other, uh, other storytellers and identifying uh, what their storytelling goals are and either um, listening to ideas that they, that they have about the ways that sound can help enhance their story either with an understanding of the nature of our characters or what they're going through emotionally or the things that our, our character understands in the moment that aren't visual things or sometimes my job is to uh, identify <laughs> or sometimes my job is to hear what their broader story storytelling goals are and suggest ways in which sound might play a bigger role in those storytelling goals. Um, then I direct my team of sound editors um, to um, cut sounds, <laughs> uh, to edit sounds that uh, are in line with those goals. I uh, get it back from my sound editors, com compare um, my notes against their work, make tweaks, design stuff myself, rework dialogue myself in line with my client's expectations. And then, um, the next part of the process, oh, you know, we shoot ADR, shoot Foley, all that stuff. And then once it's all ready to go, I, and I review it together, then I hand off to my esteemed colleagues, either <laughs> either Juan or Frankie, or some very, very, in a very similar chair. Um, and then re-recording mixers. Put it all together. <laughs> um, in the re-recording world, in the mixing world of things, we take all those elements that Brian just described, which is all the cut dialogue, all the ADR, um, all the composed music, all the sound effects, all the, all the Foley and all the backgrounds. And then we try to create a track where it seems as natural as possible for what the movie or what the situation calls for. So we're, we're mixing thousands of tracks together, getting the right levels, making sure the dialogue is clear, making sure the music is playing nice and big when it needs to, making sure the sound effects have their moments when things are exploding or flying by. So um, our job is basically to take all those tracks and somehow create something 
that goes in line with the story, goes in line with the vision of the director and uh, picture editors and producers. And uh, they're also in the room with us at the, t at the same time, still, you know, honing it in and creating it and molding it to their liking. Nice. Uh, um, what does your family think you do? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Go ahead, Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they, they think we're, we're living the lives of luxury. They work on the outside in the rain and the heat and we're air conditioning and heated and fed <laughs> uh, around the clock. Um, it, it's an interesting concept because sound in general is um, transparent. So, so everybody thinks it just kind of comes from the set. And the actuality is the only thing that comes from the set is the production track, um, the actor's lines, uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. So uh, it has to go to a person like Brian to assess that material, so on and so forth. So as, as it moves through the post-production process, um, that's where we come in. So, you know, there's, we never not finish. So our sacrifice is our time and that it has a ripple effect on the family unit, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, we always have to budget that and, and fight for our time and, and fight for, uh, you know, um, to try to keep the, the workplace in good condition for creativity. Um, so, so the family thinks we just, you know, the outside, the peripheral, maybe, maybe my, you know, my wife and daughter understand it, but the peripheral, you know, they, they think we just kind of put these soundtracks together and it's, you know, nine to five five days a week isn't that right one <laughs> well yeah my kids uh you know I, I take my kids to work with me sometimes and they, they're just like why are you going over this scene over and over and over again and um I try to explain it but to them it's literally it feels like you know everything's like oh wow you guys are working on a movie and you put sounds in and that's the end of it really you know that nobody really understands all the the balancing that we're doing, the EQing, the, all of the technical stuff that we're doing, to, and also artistic work that we're doing to try to create a great track. Um, but it's, it, you know, other family members who've never, they just think I work on a movie. That's it. What do you do? Oh, what movie are you working on? Oh, that's great. You know, but they really don't know. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, is there a specific type of software that you guys use? Um, I know that standard in industry standard is Pro Tools, but I didn't know if you use any other additional uh, outside softwares. I mean, I think Pro Tools is definitely the main thing we all use. Um, within Pro Tools, you can use a, a variety and thousands of plugins. And those are created by different software companies and different, you know, um, coders and stuff that create all kinds of different plugins. And um, there's also a lot of uh, outboard gear that we used to use. Some still do. I still do. Some people don't. Um, some people just continue to use all the plugins inside Pro Tools. But there's reverb units. There's subharmonic synthesizers, and those are actually pieces of gear. Uh, but all in all, I think Pro Tools is the main software. I'm not sure. Maybe Brian knows. Do you use anything different? Yeah, there's some there's some uh, helper software that I use in tandem with Pro Tools. Um, I don't know too many other folks that are still trying to make it work with Reaper or something as their mm -hmm. main um, as their main software suite. But um, I use Sound Particles on a lot of different designing stuff. I use um, the EdQ software suite for for ADR and for a variety of tasks conforming and stuff, it's sort of a helper. And then of course there's, um, you know, um, Isotope RX is a standalone mm -hmm. software suite that is useful for a lot of stuff. Juan, are you still using a DBX120? Yes, Hard I am. Or hardware? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to use the plugin, but you know, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> what are you using, Frankie? Well, I just uh, it bit the bullet uh -huh. and um, all in the box. Um, we were hybrid, slightly hybrid using the Harrison backend mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, in and out to the recorder and back to the monitor array. Um, but with the new stage on the lot now, it's full, 
full tilt boogie, full mire, full mire, full pro tools, full frame, everything. Yeah. Are you and moving around? Are you moving those mixes between different rooms? Um, as of right now, a lot of construction going on on the lot. Um, so we're really kind of high. So, um, so far it's translated great to the market. Um, so that's where we're at right now. So it's a little paint still drying. <laughs> Laura, just so you know, when we say in the box, that means we're all inside Pro Tools. Oh, great. Oh, Pro great. Tools is the box. It is everything. It's what it's our main source of, of playback, of recording, everything. So, yeah. Did you? It's the, the only game in town. <laughs> um, did you um, all have to go to film school, or did you learn? Um, just through practice or how, how did you get the experience that you uh, could translate into a future project or a gig? Mm, um, a lot of unhappy clients in the early days. <laughs> 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 a lot of, there was no rags to riches here. Um, um, actually started at a console manufacturer, Quad 8 Electronics. They, they basically built all the 70s, 80s, uh, film re-recording consoles uh, for film um, for all the major studios, uh, especially in Southern California. Um, so I started working for them at, I think I was eight, yeah, about 18, 18 and a half, 19. Uh, so learned that part of the business. And then from that point, um, got an opportunity to uh, help build uh, Canon Films. So I jumped ship to the studio side of um, integration of, you know, mixing stage, building facility, et cetera, one of, one of, you know, many. And from that point, because I knew the gear and knew the designs and the execution of those, uh, it came to fruition as a, as a live mixing stages. Uh, then I sat in the mixing chair, knew the equipment. So it was all for me was by default. And that was pre-automation, so it was eye, ear, hand coordination that you have to have. And uh, with a sports background, martial arts, boxing, football, baseball, basketball, I could execute the move. I didn't know, I didn't have any film sense uh, by any stretch or storytelling uh, for that matter, but I could actually execute. I could move the faders, move the panners and get stuff in, you know, semi-sync with picture. Uh, so that's by default. Um, so I was starting to mix film at 21 and uh, a lot of bruises and scabs and, <laughs> and whatnot, but uh, I'm sitting here with you today. Thank you. Juan, did you go to school for film? Um, I actually uh, went to Full Sail, which is an audio engineering school or uh, it's a university now and it's in Florida. And um, back when I went, uh, the school was very small. Now it's very big. And um, it was a one year uh, kind of intensive program where you had classes all around the clock. And, but they had consoles, they had gear, they had uh, Pro Tools, they had um, all this old audio equipment where you can actually touch and play with. And um, they were more focused on recording audio for bands and CDs and music. Um, but as we all know, in audio, that's a good foundation to know all that stuff because it translates to everything. Audio is audio across all mediums. But um, it was definitely focused on recording guitars and drums and bands and vocals and stuff. So um, they had a very small portion, which was um, sound for motion picture and TV. It was only like two or three classes, and that's kind of where I gravitated to, and I really enjoyed that. So after I graduated Full Sail, I um, went to their placement department, and they had told me that there were quite a few Full Sail graduates that were in Los Angeles, in Burbank, working um, in post facilities. And they gave me some numbers. I called, I flew out there, I interviewed, they gave me an internship. And the only position they actually had, because at the moment, I really didn't know what route to go. It, it, within audio, you can do 
many different things as you can you know as you know you can be a sound effects editor you can be a foley editor you could be a dialogue editor you could be a supervising sound editor you can be a sound designer you can be a mixer you can go into adr you know so there are all these different things it just so turned out that that facility at the time when i went and knocked on the door they needed someone to be the mix tech for the re-recording stage and so me not knowing anything about what to do i was like absolutely i would love that i'll do it and i've been on a dubbing stage my whole career ever since then that one decision it has been it so i started off as a, uh, a mix technician and i was in charge of patching everything and making sure all the automation is labeled and all working correctly and labeling all the recorders and i worked in the back room basically of a, of a dubbing stage for many years and then um, i got an opportunity to go work at skywalker and when I got there, doing the same job, being an assistant, I was able to watch these really great mixers mix um, some of these huge shows. And, you know, it took me a while to get the, um, the courage to make the leap and try to do mixing. Um, but um, eventually I did because I felt like I had learned a, a lot watching these guys do, do the job. And... And I did. So now I've been mixing for, uh, see, 15 years or something like that. So, yeah. nice. nice. <laughs> the 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 first mix tech job that you yeah jumped at. Like what what kind of console were you teching on? Around, around about what year was that? Um, that was back in 1996. It was a Harrison B2 Series B2. It was an analog desk, uh, but it was digitally controlled with automation, flying faders, the whole thing. So that was my first endeavor into <laughs> console stuff. And um, it's great. I, I, I truly believe that learning on an analog console is the only way to get that foundation of knowing how to get audio from anywhere to anywhere in that room. Yeah, and um, nowadays because it's digital, audio can go anywhere. It could be anywhere. You can send it over here, over there. Do that. The multi, you know, duplicate whatever. Um, but I just love knowing that signal flow and knowing that console and everything. And I think that helped me a lot through my career. I think. For sure, I didn't go to film school. Um, um, my, I've been working in like in sound, uh, in mostly live sound since I was 14, like my first job was in a theater doing events, like auditorium style events. And then I started doing sound for my church and then I started, and I got a job at a touring company. And like the first thing that I did there was they're like, well, we need this new 40 channel snake soldered. So, you know, so, so you, when you're working in live sound and you don't have a lot of time between like, I can't hear the singer and the crowd starts throwing drinks at you, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> there's a very strong, very strong incentive to like get the solder joints just right, you know, and, and, and like you're saying, like working on an analog console, you, you really develop the skills and again, you have to develop them pretty fast yeah. um, of like, I'm getting signal here. It's not, I'm getting signal here. I'm not getting signal here. So this is where the problem is. So chasing down and troubleshooting real fast. So it's kind of what my background uh, was. And one of the dudes who, uh, a, good, a very good friend, um, who was at the touring sound company where I worked when I was a kid, starting at like 17 to like 24 or whatever, um, he uh, at some point got an internship at Fox Blue Sky after he graduated from school. Um, right. He ended up taking a degree in communications. I took a degree in electrical engineering. And he was just like, what's sound editing for TV? You know, we'd like, made like one movie with some kooks in Ohio. Um, but that was all he was like, I don't know. So he came out for a couple of years and was like, um, when I was pretty much done with the music thing and the touring thing, he was like, uh, I think you're probably going to want to move to LA. Like that's, that's probably the play. And I was like, cool. Sounds good. <laughs> and you've been there now you're there ever since. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I came out to crash on his couch for a couple months and see what it was like. And I was like, yeah, this is like, you know, we used to make records and, and, and support the vision of, you know, some kooks with Telecasters or whatever, you know, back in the 90s and 2000s. And, and then there was something really fun about 
supporting that same sense of like 60% technical and 40% creative support for someone else's creative vision. Like, oh, I see what you want to do there. Let's build you something <laughs> that's, that's going to help with that. Or um, let's create a set of conditions in which we can try that and see if that works, you know, either on this album or on screen. Um, so there's a real direct parallel sort of there. For me. Great. Is there a, uh, a project or show or feature that really captivated you wanting to work specifically in the sound department? Yeah, for me, for me, it was, um, I'm probably uh, going to date myself here, but I saw, you know, when I saw Jurassic Park in the theater back in the early 90s, I, I was blown away by the sound and I, you know, that for some reason, after watching movies my whole life, that movie for some reason just sparked my interest in how did they do that? Like, you can't go out and record a dinosaur. Like, how do you, and not that I asked those questions even beforehand, like Star Wars and all that, like, how come I never thought about, I was too young for that. So um that right timing of that happened and when that movie came out there they did a lot of uh, behind the scenes and uh this is how they created these dinosaurs and blah 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 and one of those segments was sound and they were interviewing gary redstrom and they talked about skywalker sound and um all the great work that he had what well, other movies he had done and i was like oh i like the sound in that movie too i like the sound oh wow this is amazing so there's a job that you can do sounds for a movie this is amazing you know and so it snowballed into you know continuing to look into it and all that and then i found full sail and um they had that boards they had boards that the guy was you know they had the synclavier which was a sound design tool which is basically a big keyboard and it's attached to a computer and it has like all these different parameters where you can bend the sound and pitch it and do all this cool stuff. And they had five of those machines, which was the same machine he used to create the T-Rex and all the dinosaur sounds. So immediately I was like, hold on a second, wait, you know, so I put two and that was it. Like a year later, I was in, in, in full sale, taking, going through the course, I'm gonna to move to LA. I'm gonna do this, and um, now I've been at Skywalker working with Gary Rydstrom for years now. It's it's pretty crazy. Was the name Skywalker like was 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 that always your North Star like from? Yeah. Oh yeah. Skywalker was always my. That's the place I want to go to. I want to meet that guy. <laughs> I want to work on those movies. You know, it was it was really strange and and so funny because my wife. When I started dating her, and I did, and I met her actually at the studio where I first got my internship in LA in Burbank. It was called EFX Systems. It was right down on Burbank and Victory Boulevard. Frankie knows where it is, and um, she was a receptionist on the weekends. So I only saw her every once in a while. Oh, well, you know, we started talking, went out to dinner uh, on our very first date, and she's like, "Where do you see yourself in five years?" And I was like, "What is this a job interview? Like, what is going on here?" And I you know jokingly mentioned i want to go work at skywalker sound and i want to blah, blah, blah. here it is nice yeah that was it for me <laughs> brian or uh, for, for me it was it's a little bit odd i i remember nothing profound here but i just remember seeing uh apocalypse now at the chinese and i was young i was i don't know 14 13 something like that. And I was sitting in the balcony when the RPG, which, you know, a, a rocket was fired uh, during, you know, they were on the river and uh, it was night sequence and uh, a surprise attack occurred and this RPG rocket came shooting through the theater. And I remember having a adverse effects physically to duck. I remember ducking. So, and you know, obviously the surround, tra I mean, the rockets traveled into the surround as a buy. So it felt like you're seeing it on the big screen and it went sonically, it went by you. Nothing profound, like I want to do that. It just, I just had an impact on me. I just remember that to this day. Uh, I don't remember what I did yesterday, but I remember that. Um, <laughs> so, so it was, it was interesting. And then as one thing led to the next, um, as, as this crazy life has led me to. 
um, you know, just connected with that. And it's always been there. And when you're doing it every day, um, sometimes you take it for granted, but, but the 14 year old's still in there somewhere. I was always going to do sound. Um, it was just a matter of where I was going to do sound. So, so my path was like less like which department inside film and more like what application of sound is the best fit. So, but I will say that um, in Apocalypse Now as well, the um, the ceiling fan into helicopter transition yeah. it was yeah. really eye opening in terms of like this is a creative choice. Like this is this this is someone drawing a parallel between this thing and this other thing and making it making a transition using sound. And that was really eye opening for me. Nice. Nice. Um, can you uh, tell us what your first gig was and how you got it? Did you have a mentor or an agent or uh, any kind of help to get you into that first gig? Um, Uh, well, again, it was by default for me. So uh, just had some great mentors by default, I suppose. Um, I the, read, what was the gig? Was uh, the well, it was, it was just coming, coming out of, you know, getting out of high school, staying in school mode, getting into, you know, electronic school. I was going to go down the path of computers. 1983, computers are what it's ultimately going to be. Might as well start diving into that technology you can work around the world if you can you know uh, it would open many doors and got into audio and then from that point you know next stop was quad eight so there's always been somebody uh that took uh took a chance on this chicano from the barrio in los angeles uh and gave me an opportunity so you know the, the first one up was uh and I may forget the names, you know, the, the guy who hired me at Quad 8. So I, I, Gilbert Perez got me the gig at Quad 8. He was my, my uncle, my field, my field uh, art best friend. He, he got me an interview. He didn't, you know, he worked in the, he worked in the, uh, in the machine shop. He was a foreman of the machine shop doing all the console uh, frames and whatnot. Uh, but he, he got me an interview and I bugged the, uh, I think the guy's name was Lloyd. I bugged him enough where they finally gave me a gig, so. And then on to the next, uh, you know, Corey Bailey, Quad 8, uh, asked him, you know, said, I'd love to work here. We we're They were building Canon. Canon was drywall. I showed up one day to replace a power supply uh, in one of their uh, tape machines. And I said, I'd really love to work here one day. I was 21 years old and he said, you're hired. So I'm like, wow, I'm going from manufacturing to so I refer to these people as my audio fathers, really, not mentors, but my audio fathers. So Corey said, you're hired, you're done, like, great. You know, when can you start? So I went from manufacturing to a studio, you know, and then from there, um, I always wanted to get to Warner Hollywood, stage D, Warner Hollywood uh, for Southern California is the Mecca. Um, it's where, where it began, it was Goldwyn. Um, so next thing I know, opportunity to, to sit next to Don Mitchell. I, I followed uh, in the footsteps of Gray Landecker, of, you know, uh, Kevin O'Connell, and I was the next one up. Uh, so Don Mitchell gave me the opportunity to sit next to him and so on. So there's always been someone, you do make your own breaks, um, you know, just be true to yourself, true to your calling and good things will happen. But there's might have been fortunate to, to work with some great people and get some great opportunities from them. Um, my first LA gig was uh, working on a, uh, there was a, there was like a weekly uh, drama on, oh man, whenever, what, what I forget what network was, the w, WB split it into, split into the CW and my network TV or something. Yeah, I think that's in, right. In, in 06 or something. And it was like a daily high, high stakes, much music <laughs> drama uh, called Fashion House. And my friend that I mentioned before from the touring song company, Vince Tennant, um, was working on that show and he needed someone to handle the Saturday recap shows. So conform from stems, the dialogue, music and effects. Um, and his, his editors were overbooked. 
um, my band had just canceled a tour in Europe and, and decided not to put out the record as a result. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do, you know, the next day. I, didn't, I had no particular direction. He was like, that was when he was like, you should probably move to L.A. And I was like, okay, fine. Yeah. And so I came out and, and learned how to do, you know, we had made, like I said, we made records and so familiar with the tools, but learned some of the, the standards and expectations for how to do that style of conforms real fast and get get the Saturday episode sort of cut when I was like, pretty good training ground mm. um that, that was at a, a sound house over in um just over Qu the Klinga pass uh, called wildwoods it was still there uh for me um you know because i was working at a facility it was whatever whatever movie they were awarded to work on um and i was the tech for that stage that was the that was the movie i would work on so the very first credit i ever got was a movie called sprung really bad movie <laughs> with Tommy Davidson and I think Jada Pinkett uh, Smith, who yeah, we all know about, right? Um, but, um, you know, they she had to come in for ADR. So she was in the building and uh, Will, Will Smith came to drop her off and he was in the building. And um, and so that, that, that was kind of my introduction was working on some of these, you know, lower budget movies that um, that facility worked on. So I worked on that. And then I think my second one was Soul Food. And then the next bigger one was Blade with Wesley Snipes. So those kind of movies is what started out. And then because I'm attached to a, a, a dubbing stage, you know, the dubbing stage is constantly booked and constantly working my credits just started skyrocketing. Like I'm talking hundreds of movies, just like, you know, when this movie's done, okay, here's the next movie and so on. So we did a lot of um, IMAX movies, did a lot of, you know, lower uh, B level movies. Um, and then when I got to Skywalker, same kind of deal, right? They're working on this movie or Star Wars and this, you know, more little, little higher caliber films there. And then again, the credits just keep adding up. So, yeah. Um, I believe all three of you are working at facilities. Do you get a choice on what you work on next or do you basically have to work on whatever they give you? Um, I think throughout, as, as a re-recording mixer, you actually build a lot of um, relationships with clients and um, that tend if the relationships are great they tend to always come back to you and they always call you and see what you're available if not and then so there's a little bit of that where there's a director that I work with often when he has a movie it's kind of like okay is Juan available let's call him you know let's let's go ahead and um reserve him you know um so I built a relationship with a couple directors and then also when Skywalker when, when you go, when you bring your movie to a facility and Skywalker, we have quite a bit uh, of mixers. So they will present to the client a list and they'll choose sometimes who they want to work with. So they look at their credits and they look at what other movies they work on, who they've worked with before. And maybe they'll do some little background, you know, asking around and stuff. So it's, I think it's a mix. It's a mix. I think, you know, a lot of it is, oh, well, here the facility is bringing in this movie. I'm available. I can work on it. What do you want to? I'm like, yeah, sure. And other ones are like, hey, you've been requested. It's going to be, these are the dates. We're going to hold you for that. So it's a little bit of both for me. Um, well, I'm at Universal. So it's 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 uh, about half and half uh, outside client tell relationship like Juan's saying. You have those relationships um, and then you have the studio you know, in their production side of things, want to support the facilities on lot. So we do about a 50-50 scenario for us. So we're meeting new clients through the studio um, and or their repeat, repeat clients with relationships from the past. Um, for most of the group isn't like associated with a particular studio, so I don't have that sort of channel of um, work. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I get, I feel pretty blessed in that I, on the feature side, I get to read scripts and decide how aggressively I want to pursue a project, um, if it interests me. Um, and on the broadcast side, it's mostly 
been repeat clients of mine that I've done stuff, done projects with before for the most part. Um, so, yeah, I haven't like, I haven't had the experience of like, this is just what I need to do this week. That, that's not part of my year. Um, I know each project is different, but do you have a general timeline on Brian when you get a turnover um, or a sequence uh, and then you have to do all your prep work and then hand it off to the mixers? Do you guys have uh, a general timeline on on what, you know, how long it would take to do your prep work and then give it to the mixers? And then the mixers, how long it would take to actually mix everything? I know, again, each project is different, but uh, roughly yeah. how long are you on a project? The range is really wide. Um, there's a nearly, nearly linear relationship with the overall film budget, um, you know, in terms of like, you want a really fast car? How much can you afford to spend? You know, um, uh, you know, f as little as, you know, turnaround time between like picture lock when, when I was at a different facility on, on the really low end, turnaround time between picture lock and, and first day of the final dub could be as little as three weeks. Um, you know, if, if, um, uh, and then as much as, or, or how much you want to spend. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, are, there are, I mean, not, not that I have access to these kind of shows, but there yeah. certainly are, are projects that like, okay, cool, sound starts at the same time as picture editorial starts, and we're just building sounds along the way for a year until we get to picture lock and mix. You know, I mean, one would probably speak to that better than I. Yeah, that, that sounds, yeah. Um, I would say um, that it all depends on the budget of the film like Brian is saying. So big budget movies, you get more time, lower budget movies, you get no time. Um, so um, I can um, give you for an example, a Marvel movie. Marvel movie will uh, picture, uh, well, sound editorial will start pretty early on because there's a lot of sound design that needs to happen. So a, a small crew feeding sounds to the picture department all the way to getting a turnover and and cutting cutting as much sounds as you can to get it ready for the premix i would say anywhere between three to four months right and then come time to premix for me i usually get about five weeks of just premixing and then the final mix starts and the final can go outwards of eight weeks of final mixing. Um, this and this is like a Marvel this is a big budget movie, right? You know, you don't really. This is not very common. And then after that, then there's a couple of weeks, three to four weeks of just doing versioning, uh, print mastering, and your um, IMAX mixes and your home theater mixes and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the range there. I'm not sure how much that is total, but yeah, that's kind of what I. Frankie, are some of your movies on that same scale? That is a different world. Don't... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, all I can add to that, you guys have it covered exactly right, um, is I've always believed that we really don't finish. We just run out of time. So that is for sure. We can, we can tweak until. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So our heart's content, but uh, sometimes it's just over. Yeah. During your mixing stage, do you have producers or directors that come in and sit with you while you do it? Or do you have um, a, uh, a period in which you present it to them as you would you seem fit? And then from there, go into versions of notes and and. Um, what, what, how would you describe that workflow? Mm, yeah, I mean, it, I, for me, it's it's um, depends on the relationship, really. I mean, if it's a um, you know repeat client for many years and there's a trust level, uh, then we're we're left to our own devices, really, to try to you know at least get the first pass of each reel in a pocket. Um, if we were able to do a temp mix, if they want to do get it out 
and test the movie and just kind of see where it's landing with the demographic that we're marketing to, uh, then, then we'll at least kind of cut our teeth and, you know, temporary sounds, music, so on and so forth, and put something together quickly and just kind of get a feel for it. Um, and then there's some filmmakers that are just, you know, we are working through their ears. And especially if it's an emotional film where sound carries much more emotion than the last uh, film as being subjective or objective, uh, those can be tough to try to, you know, hone in on exactly the right sound at the right time. Um, those are very interesting and those can go on for a little bit. So that, that's where, where you're in your box right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's about right. Yeah, for me, um, in the premix stage, which is where I kind of um, work on one element of the track at a time. So if I'm going to just do the backgrounds, I'll do the backgrounds for the whole movie. And then I'm going to start working on hard effects and I'll do sound effects for the whole movie. And then I'll do Foley and then do the Foley for the whole movie. So during that time, that's that's what we call a premix. There are no clients there. Um, um, I'll give The example again is going to be like a Marvel movie. I'll be premixing at Skywalker Sound. Um, all the clients are down at Disney in Burbank. And once I get a pass through the whole movie kind of where I want it, then we go down to Disney stage A and then we set up and we do get ready for the final mix. At that point, I have pre-mixed most of the sound effects or all the sound effects through the whole movie. Uh, my partner has pre-mixed all the dialogue for the whole movie. And when we get down there to set up for the final, we get the music delivered from the composer for the first time. So then we set up the board in a way where I'm on one side doing sound effects, backgrounds, Foley, everything. And then my partner's doing dialogue and music, getting all that ready to go. And then we hit play and we play it all together and we try to get it a, a good balance. Um, with the Marvel clients, because we've done so many movies with them, they literally leave us alone. And then they'll say, uh, when can you play real one for us? And they're like, um, give a, you know, tomorrow after lunch or something. It was like, okay, great. So we'll work for a whole day, a day and a half, get it kind of ready. They'll come in and that's the director, the picture editor, producers, uh, whatnot, whoever uh, is in charge or whoever has input to, to the project, they'll come sit down, we'll play for them. We'll take some notes. We'll either uh, address those notes right away, depending on how hard they are. And then we move on to the next reel and so on. So that's, that's the way it kind of works for me. And then Brian, do you, I know if, as a supervising story, a uh, sound editor, you um, have a little bit more time, I would think, to kind of organize the different groups, the different, uh, uh, the Foley and the sound effects and working with those editors. Um, how much time generally on your shows or um, features do you get? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it spans the it spans the range um, connected to to, um, to budget in terms of like when um, in terms of time that I get um, to work like on our own versus working with the directors and editors and so forth. Um, I try to loop. Um, I try to loop indie directors in quite early and indie editors quite early. I try to to front load as much of the important like tonal establishing sound design as early in the process I can so that um, they they drag it on their tracks they drag it um, in, inside the avid or whatever um, along the, the process whenever possible not always possible because of you know the way the calendars shake out and so forth but um, I try to um, you know take on a few moments and build them and send, send them back to to a let the picture editor and the director know that they're that we're on the same page that they're in good hands sound wise and that you know like well here's the, here's the level of quality that the sound of the whole show is going to be when we get to it but you know only done these three scenes uh whatever um and um and i try to have reviews pretty often along the way because you know I, I what i can get done in my room on my own time pretty significant and i like to maximize everything we can do in here before we go to the big expensive room and I found that that I found clients that appreciate that, you know, like supervisors like see that I'm really, you know, 
my objective, the way that I work, my objective is not to nickel and dime. My objective is to maximize the resources they've been gracious enough to, to bring in so we can make the most movie that we can for the resources that they've got. And I take that very seriously. Um, so whatever I can do with these knobs and faders, <laughs> it's going to save us some time with the other knobs and faders in the big expensive room. Um, so, um, for any aspiring writer or attendee that we have currently, um, do you have any words of wisdom or any guidance that they can do in prep that can help with the post sound, um, that you can recommend? I would just say that my strongest client relationships are with the people that I've worked with in the past that, that have, have seen the difference that sound has made at the end and have wanted my input at the beginning as a result. So the next time they come through, they send me an early draft of a script and we talk about it. And we talk about from broader things like this is the kind of thing that your audience is going to remember from real two to real five versus your audience member isn't going to make the connection sound wise between this thing they heard in real three into real four, you know, like, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a pass through a script and I'll mark up, you know, like, this will be good. Let's make sure that we use a metal one, not a plastic one here, you know, tell your props department. I'll, I'll mark up. Let's talk about this location, <laughs> you know, for dialogue noise reasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just having a, a dedicated set of eyes on a script early on for like, I can foresee either a problem or I can foresee a creative opportunity just from a sound, a sound lens, absolutely invaluable um, for some of my clients who really trust me. And if you've got, yeah, if you've, if you've got someone that you trust who does think about sound 16 hours a day, <laughs> it might be useful to have that person re make a read through. Do you have any um, words of wisdom for anybody that is just starting out either going to film school or is trying to get that first foot in the door for um, any, what direction they might be able to go into or, you know? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty hard uh, question to answer. Um, the one thing I found working in the business um, for the years that I had is that, um, your attitude and how well you get along with people goes uh, very far. And um, that can set the tone of what your career is going to be. Um, if, if people enjoy working with you, they're gonna ask you back on, to work on other projects. And if you have a good attitude, you're gonna have um, good relationships with coworkers and stuff. So, um, uh, it's just that I, you know, learning all the technical stuff is, is yes, you have to learn all that stuff, but it, it, I think there's so much to how you get along with people. Cause in this business, we work with all kinds of different people, all, I mean, different positions from different backgrounds everywhere. You have to be able to, to kind of, um, work through all that and um, the people that do that the best, I think, get go the farthest and, and have a, you know, very good long career in film. Sounds good. When do I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, all I can say is exposure. I mean, really, it was well put by, by everyone. Uh, just expose yourself to depending on, on exactly what you want to do in this business. Try to get as much exposure. Bother, get your foot in the door. Be humble, be driven, and uh, good things will happen. Nice. Brian, anything? Um, I think that a lot of people um, that are that are working in, in film feel really lucky to be doing so. And I have um, noticed that the people who are the best and most well-connected tend to be fairly supportive and generous with their time for, for people who like show a real drive and want to get in. Like, if somebody wants to, I mean, maybe this is more a pre-COVID thing, but if somebody wants to, to like 
sit in my edit bay while I'm cutting some tough dialogue and like be, be quiet and <laughs> write down questions on a notepad for two hours. <laughs> and, and then we go to lunch and talk about like why, why X, Y, Z, you know? Um, if, if someone is, is going to invest the time, that's the level of drive that I, I want to see in the people that I have trained as assistants and then and, and brought up to sound editors and then brought up to whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that uh, Frankie's um, suggestions to be humble is very important, but also like, yeah, be a little like, hey, <laughs> Yeah. Is there room for me to shadow? You know, I think that, look, I've worked in a warehouse. Like, this is a great job. <laughs> this is, <laughs> we're very lucky. Yes, we are. Beats working um, for a living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sure does. Um, Don't tell our family that, though. <laughs> um, yeah. What do our, what our families think we do? They think we work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's work. Uh, it's very long nights, um, but um, but yeah, w we need a, to see a lot of drive to to um, invest our own time in, in something because like this is not it's, it's not a throat neutral kind of job. Like the, the 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 nights are long, the demands are very high. But as one said, like if, if you can stay a, a person who's still fun to hang out with at lunch even through all that. <laughs> gonna go a lot further. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, one last question. Uh, what are you currently working on? Um, or have up next. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished um, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which just literally came out. We finished maybe a month ago, uh, and I am working. I'm not sure if I can say the project I'm working on. I'm working on a project for Netflix right now. Uh, I am working on um, the latest um, uh, Alejandro Adnarto movie. It's mm. called Bardo. Mm. So it's um, it uh, it's amazing. Is that too? Um. Can't say exactly, oh, but uh, oh, if you're a fan of his that. films, if you are a fan of those films, uh, it, it's a special one for sure. Okay. Cool. And Brian, what are you working on? Um, I don't know if the, my current projects are under wraps or not, but I'll say that the next thing I have coming out is um, uh, a movie that um, I mixed, actually, which is sort of a rare thing for me, but I did mix, mix this one. Uh, it's coming out at Tribeca. A film called Next Exit, um, and uh, it looks like I'm actually going to be able to break free from LA and fly out for the premiere. So. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining, and uh, uh, thank you again, Frank, Juan, and Brian, um, and uh, thank you, NBCU, for co-sponsoring this panel for us. And um, please uh, check us out for more future events and um, panels. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, guys. See you, Frankie. See you, Brian. Thank you, guys. Bye. Talk soon.